Hello, this is Father David. Here with day 14, the final day of the Dormition Fast 2024. Now we will have a video for tomorrow uh, for the day of the feast, but this is chapter 12. Uh, of course, we already read chapter 13 on the Transfiguration. But this being the penultimate day of the final day, actually, of the fast, and the penultimate day of this series. We have this chapter, which is right before the end, celebrating the feast. And it's called, The Fast Doesn't Start on the First Day. That's just a reflection on this period of time that we have uh, uh, just undergone. And, you know, it is a, it's quite a good chapter. It's quite a good chapter, very poignant, very uh, uh, direct. And uh, one of the things that Father David brings out is to highlight one of the purposes of the fasting periods of the church. And it is to identify our slavery to our appetites, as he puts it, and to help make us more sensitive to that slavery. I think that's the important thing, the truly important thing out of this chapter, is that, you know, we think in terms of, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, oftentimes when we start a fast, if we're determined to participate in it, you know, we sort of begin with, you know, joy and excitement. I'm going to get past that bad habit, that sinful, you know, whatever it is I bring to confession every time. And so the fasting, you know, we adjust our diet and it's, you know, kind of exhilarating if we participate in it. Yes, I'm being spiritual. I'm, I'm working on my communion with God, my relationship with God, my, my life in the church. And then, of course, we get into a fasting period. Maybe that's day two. Maybe that's week two. Whatever it happens to be, maybe it's day one. But there will come a time, a choice, where we could fast or we could break the fast. And Father David Smith talks about, you know, as a priest, I know. And as priests, we know. Whether we hear it in confession or simply to uh, guess regarding experience, that there's many people that do not keep the fast. And this is a sad, uh, I would say sad state of affairs that that, that seems to uh, just complain about the situation. It is sad for the people. It is sad for the one that does not participate in the fast. What it does, Father David says, is it takes the hitting rock bottom of the prodigal son. He truly did hit rock bottom. He truly did see the destitution of his own situation, which was truly destitute. It was truly uh, without any hope. And he said, I need to return to the house of the father. What fasting does is it provides us with a sort of artificial bottom. He calls it raising the bottom, right? It doesn't take us as far to fall as the prodigal son before we realize, you know, I have completely disregarded the uh, directives of my God within his church. And I'm really even unable to abstain from meat or cheese for these few days. I really am unable to. I am a slave to my appetite. Or I am a slave to, you know, whatever else it is. My own appetites, my own desires. I am a slave to this. It is making us more sensitive. Likewise, he talks about the sacrament of confession. Now, I will confess to you. I uh, have contacted my father confessor. It is too late for me to make confession prior to the feast of Dormition. I should have made these plans earlier. 
I did not. And so, however, God willing, I will be doing so later this week. Uh, but this uh, confession is often uh, and should be regularly a part of our fasting regimen. Something that, not simply as a commandment or something to do, but again, something to increase our awareness, our sensitivity to our own need for God. And uh, Father David Smith uh, speaks of it this way, because he's talking about St. John the Baptist, his legacy that he left the church was the word repent, turn from your sins. Repent, he said, and this means you. In the sacrament of confession, you sharpen your sensitivity to sin. Sometimes people say to their priests that they don't, need, they don't believe they need to go to confession in order to be forgiven, right? And then he says, they're right. And in a sense, they are right. I mean, what do we do at the beginning of every meal? Well, we should. We pray the Our Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's no priest, you know, with a stole over your head. Whenever you say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt, you know, or if you're in the car and you, you know, swear at the person who just cut you off, maybe you make the sign of the cross, Lord, have mercy, Lord, forgive me. Well, that begins the process and God is quick to forgive. But we do also have the sacrament of confession, not only to name these things, not only to have the priest as the representative of the congregation, of the family of God, to reconcile you to the family. Right? This is, these are in our prayers that we pray at confession. But the other thing that he says, he says, they're right. You don't need to go to confession in order to be forgiven. They need instead to go to confession in order to speak their sins, to feel the weight of sin. It's ridiculous nature. It's monotony. It's determination to draw us away from our saving God. You go to confession in order to hear with your own ears some advice to hear a human being pray that God would forgive you. Of course, God will forgive your sins when you cry uh, them to him alone in your bedroom. But your ability to detect the pernicious grip of sin in your life, its wiles and its techniques, its strategy for defeating your every attempt to become a righteous person is sharpened by the advice of the one who hears your confession. Either the priest of God who knows and loves you and longs to even to give his life that you might experience God's forgiving grace or the unresponsive pillow in your, under your head, which sometimes offers a certain kind of rest but speaks, no forth, speaks forth no hope at all. This is the bottom that is raised for us to see more clearly our need for God because it is so easy to forget. The church provides us with these fasts, which again, Father David says, they're not total fasts, which can be limited, even a source of pride. Intermittent fasting, I'm gonna go without food for 18 hours or whatever. And then you, you can do anything for a little while. But it's this extended period of time where, as St. John Cassian says, the real rule of every fast is as you're eating, because it's not a full fast, stop while you're still a little bit hungry to keep yourself in that place of vulnerability. Oh, I could eat more. Mm, that next serving or that little dollop of whatever, mashed potatoes, however it is, it sure does look good. I'm still kind of peckish. Hold off. Let that gnawing, let that bubbling up desire, let that uh, desire, that little thing that desires to be gratified, just let it sit, let it simmer, right? Let it be there and let it hear the word, no, no. This is what we're training ourselves to do, is to say, my body is not my boss. My desires are not what rule me. They are not what define me. They are not my identity. I am not what I want. 
At the same time, I am not what I want to be, pun fully intended. All of this is revealed by the fast. So as we enter into the festal period this evening, if you have been faithful in the fast, as we say at Pascha, thank God. May you take the lessons that you've learned and grow from them. May you hunger even more to enter into the life of the church, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the growth into our Lord Jesus Christ. May our ladies' prayers go with you. If you have come to the end of this fast and you have failed miserably, far more days than not, you have completely disregarded the fast and had KFC and completely given yourself over to laziness or debauchery. Learn from this. Learn from this. Repent. Come to confession. Confess. Name these sins. For in doing so, there is still healing. There is still growth. There is still life. There is still forgiveness. There is still a way forward. There is still mercy. But these things must be named so that you can see your actual place and state. But fear not, for it is God who sees sinners. He has come to save them. He has come to aid them. He has come to anyone who turns to him in repentance. He will by no means cast out. Learn from this and enter into the life of the church with a new result to lower yourself in humility and to say, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That as you continue on and you go, you go with new eyes, showing your actual state, but understanding that God is yet able to bring us up through repentance into his glory. So Lord God bless you, Lord willing. We'll see you tomorrow for the final video. Bye-bye.